Imagine you're a future archaeologist trying to understand humans from the early 1900s through the early 2000s. What do you think the most robust, compelling, comprehensive source for obtaining that understanding might be? If I were you, I might be thinking the Library of Congress or landfills, perhaps. And in truth, both of those do hold portions of the collections I'm thinking of, but that's not what I'm going for. I think there's a strong argument to say that broadcast collections produced and or held by broadcasting entities across the world is the answer to this question. Radio and television broadcasters have held a unique place in the hearts of people around the globe over the past century and more. In their mission to entertain, document, and inform, they have amassed some of the largest and most important collections throughout the world, each collection providing deep insights into the time and place in which they were broadcast. Broadcast collections hold the stories of the forming of countries and governments. They hold documentary evidence of culture and politics. They store the comedy, the drama, and the sports that captivated the audiences they reached. Leveraging the power of audio, film, and video, there is arguably no greater record of humanity for this period than the culmination of these broadcast collections. I'm delighted to have Breck de Klerk join me on the episode today. Brecht has served on the board of Fiat IFTA for seven years. In English, this stands for the International Federation of Television Archives, and they are self-described as the world's leading professional association for those engaged in the preservation and exploitation of broadcast archives. Brecht has served as the president of the organization for the past four years, giving him in-depth knowledge on the state of affairs with regard to broadcasting entities throughout the world. Brecht has also worked with and in broadcast archives for his entire career, Currently, Brecht serves as the head of archives for RSI, the Italian-speaking Swiss public broadcaster. Brecht's experiences and insights are so interesting and valuable, and I'm excited to be able to share his thoughts and voice with the Damn Right listeners. Remember, damn right, because it's too important to get wrong. Brecht de Klerk, welcome to the Damn Right podcast. It's an honor to have you here today. I wanted to have you on the podcast uh, to get a peek inside of uh, radio and television broadcast archives. And, and you bring a lot to the table there for a variety of reasons. You have worked on and in radio and television archives, and you have been the president of Fiat IFTA uh, for years now. Uh, so I'm really excited for you to bring a sneak peek inside of radio and television archives for our listeners that have not had the opportunity to work within those archives. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. So I'd love to start off with getting some insight into your background. And I'd like to maybe pinpoint, you know, is there is there one thing from your past, your history um, that you bring to the table that you think really informs your approach and how you work today? Well, yeah, it, it's it's of course a, a difficult question because I've I've been active in this field since since twenty years, um, and and I think if I, if you'd ask me like okay, what was that decisive moment in which you said okay, um, this is kind of a a career that I could that I could make that I could feel well in um, that the decisive, decisive moment was in fact in two thousand and ten when I attended for the first time a, a big international conference. It was um, in 2010, the International Association of Sound and Audiovisual Archives, together with the um, Association of Moving Image Archivists in the U.S., organized um, the their conference, joint conference in Philadelphia. And that was uh, four days of very Im- immersive encounters, I would say, immersive uh, experiences, um, attending all these presentations, meeting all this, these passionate people. And I was I was very lucky to be there because um, I had submitted a proposal without even asking my boss, and that was the moment <laughs> in which I said to myself, "Sometimes it's better to ask to be forgiven than to ask for permission." <laughs> and um, and that's the, the the one lesson that I drew from that experience, and it was so motivating that I kept on thriving based on on those four days only in the U.S. for uh, for quite a few years. Yeah, and um, if I remember right. You and I first met at that conference, I believe. Yeah, that's true. It's it's actually a quite ironic anecdote, I would say. I was speaking about um, a workflow to uh, to migrate the content of DAT tapes, right. digital audio right. tapes, 
and you were the, the I remember the, the room was packed and I was very proud of that. It was not a not a big room, definitely not it was maybe 30, 40 people sitting in that room. And you asked me a question at the end of my presentation. <laughs> and you have, were asking whether I had ever heard of interstitial errors. And I was so ashamed at that moment that I had to say no, me standing in front of that audience and say, okay, this uh, this guy is asking me one question and I don't even know how to answer it. But then you you reassured me and you said, like, don't worry, many people in this room won't have heard about it. So, um, so yeah, that was our first meeting, Chris. Uh, an, adv an advantageous moment, yes. Uh, <laughs> and I remember you being very, uh, I remember your, your energy. You were very, you were very energetic, very into the, I mean, as, as was I, but I just remember that about you, that you and I spoke afterwards and you were very into the conference and yeah. super energetic about it. It's funny to think back quite a while ago. So we, we yeah. later came to meet again when you were at an organization uh, and my lazy American accent will always get this wrong forever. I've said this word a million times, but so you'll have to forgive it. Give me, uh, Memo uh, was an organization when we wor started working together, it was called VIA. Uh, but uh, I'd love to, if you could talk about the work that you did there um, and what was unique about that initiative and that work. Yeah, um, I, I think I've, I've explained uh, VIA, now called Memo, uh, several times to around the globe. And I think I, it can best be explained by uh, by pointing to the pain, the pain that that Memo was was solving or is still solving, and that is that um, the audiovisual heritage of, of of many countries is spread amongst a variety of institutions like libraries, archives, museums, uh, pub public broadcasters, commercial broadcasters, smaller and bigger ones, and. If you thoroughly think about it, and if if your national government decides to take a responsibility in that, because that's not always the case throughout uh, uh, over the globe, um, then then this comes a, a a very cumbersome duty, I would say, and it can um, there is the risk that it, it becomes a very expensive one, and there is also a need uh, to do it in a very professional way, and that is that is actually the memo is the answer of the of the Flemish community, so that. Dutch speaking northern part of Belgium to the questions um, of obsolescence, of uh, degradation of audiovisual carriers, and of the increased demand uh, to, to, to audiovisual heritage. So what they, um, what they decided to do is uh, set up, uh, with a government subsidy of course, set up large scale digitization projects for audiovisual heritage, collecting in fact all those um, tapes and cassettes and films, et cetera, et cetera, that were present at so many institutions. We started off in, in 2013 with around 40 institutions, about 10 broadcasters and 30 libraries, archives, museums. And by now they are at, I think, almost 180 wow. of them. And and I am I am proud to say that when I left uh, Memo about uh, one and a half year ago, um, about 80% of that whole volume estimated at around 600 to 650,000 objects is digitized. So there is still uh, some, some, some stuff to be done, ma mainly film, um, but that is done. And um, uh, it was not only about digitization. Uh, Memo al also provided um, sustainable digital storage because also that can be a cumbersome task for, say, a small museum or a, um, a small library with just uh, a few hundred of, of, of hundreds of audiovisual carriers. So they provided also that kind of professional um, storage. You could call it a public cloud. You could somewhat compare it to oh, that. Yeah. Um, and then they also said like, what is the value of all this material if we don't valorize it, in, not in a financial way, but in a in a, I, I call, I always call it to, uh, I always refer to the return on society. Yeah. So uh, they decided to set set up, for example, an educational platform, um, shortening almost literally the distance between the archival vault and the classroom to, let's call it a few weeks, maybe a few months in some cases, a few days in in an extreme case, so that teachers can can use those materials in the classroom yeah. and. It is indeed a unique uh, construction, but because I so thoroughly believed in it, I, I still keep on spreading that word because on a 
let's say on a daily basis, I'm confronted with the situation of audiovisual heritage these days in the world. And um, the number one basic question for so many archives is, how are we going to fund our fun our functioning? How can we provide certainty? How can we approach, how we, can we tackle all these huge challenges without certainty about our funding, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. And I think that if you manage to convince a government of a, a very efficient way of dealing with this thing, and you then provide the Flemish example, yeah. that um, many governments can be interested. And we've seen that in India, for example, and we've seen that as well in New Zealand. Mm. Um, those are the only other countries where they, I wouldn't say copied the Flemish example, but rather uh, get got inspired by yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's certainly... It is one of the most masterful, comprehensive, I think, digital transformations that I've seen in that it addresses such a variety of cultural heritage, material types, content. Uh, it addresses digital preservation, digital asset management, and as you said, like the outreach engagement to classrooms um, and to the public uh, and tons of metrics and tracking around that and to, to measure success and it's, it's really a phenomenal um initiative I, I guess is the word i'm not sure if initiative is the right word or not but program entity whatever the effort has been um i think really phenomenal so uh, i appreciate you filling us in about that and uh, we'll we'll share a link to in the show notes to the organization so people can go and check that work out yeah the the, the, the nice thing about the approach is also i i want to stress is that a lot of the the information and the knowledge that they created while doing all this, they're sharing it for free and in an English version as well on their website. That's that's uh, I really want to stress this because it was one of the goals to stress their experience even beyond the Flemish borders, positively deciding to to translate stuff also into English and thereby contributing to the spread of this kind of knowledge uh, throughout the globe. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you to talk about that because it, I think it does inform, you know, it's an important part of your background and kind of the context that you come from. Could you talk a bit about you know, what you've done since uh, being at Memo? Well, um, as I said, um, one and a half year ago, I decided um, to leave Memo, um, not because I wasn't having a good time, I was having a great time, I was absolutely having a great time, but it's always been on my mind. To um, to take a challenge abroad, I am I am Belgian, um, but I but I always have had this international outlook, and um, then a a vacancy came up here in Switzerland at RSI, um, and I knew I know kind of know this organization since a, since a while. And in two thousand and eleven, uh, the uh, World Conference of the International Federation of Television Archives, of which I am now the president took place in, in Turin in Italy. And I went there by car because some people will know that I, that I have this kind of passion for, for everything that's Italian yeah. in, in, in my spare time. And I went there by car. And when driving back, um, I came in, in contact with the head of archives here at RSI. And the, the road from Turin to Belgium actually crosses the town where I'm, where I'm now living. Yes. So I decided to, to make a stopover and to visit that same RSI, and 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 I was I was stunned by what I saw because the reason that I stopped was that I wanted to see um, in an, a a very nice innovation in in my opinion that was a robot a robot to digitize their video cassette collection a three dimensional robot um, refurbished from the car industry you know those those the, those orange ones mm -hmm. you always see in 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 footage. Um, they had like refurbished that and that machine had an autonomy of five days. So for five days, Same. it could continue to digitize tapes, clean tapes, get them out, et cetera, et cetera. And I found that a marvelous innovation. And I wanted to see that. But when I arrived here at RSI, they wanted to show me something else. And that was um, their speech to text fully integrated with their documentation processes. So we are talking about an artificial intelligence that was already implemented almost 15 years yeah. ago. It's They started off with that in 2009. So on not one, but two levels, they were like, they were like, to, yeah, as far as I know, on a global scale, there were forerunners. And I said like, that, that must be a, a marvelous organization to be able to work there. So I decided to apply. 
and I'm now head of archives. And so um, head of archives, meaning that all the archival departments, whether it's the radio archive, it's a television archive, um, are under my uh, my responsibility here uh, in Italian-speaking Switzerland. I want to come back to RSI later, but I want to sidestep and talk about Fiat IFTA for a bit first. Um, you've, you've touched on the organization and, and what you've just said, but I love it. Can you tell us a bit more about what's the mission of the organization? Um, what's the makeup of the organization? And, and, and tell us a bit more about how the organization works. Yeah, first of all, Fiat IFTA stands for, um, it's a double abbreviation, International Federation of Television Archives. Fédération Internationale des Archives de Télévision, sort of French. Uh, French that sounds much better, that and, one. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, formally, our, our mission is um, uh, Fiat IFTA actively creates and exchanges expert knowledge and promotes and raises awareness of future media archiving by building and maintaining an international network and its broader community, organizing events, developing trusted resources, and taking challenging initiatives for those engaged in the field of media archives. I have to admit that I'd read that. <laughs> so um, I don't know about it. So um, yeah, that, that's actually what we're doing. We're trying um, to form a global community um, for all those engaged in, in, in media archive. So um, our membership typically uh, consists of um, around 40 to 50 percent public broadcasters, 10, 15 percent of commercial broadcasters, and then 10, 15 percent of very active, um, what I would call national audiovisual archives or national archives and national libraries that are involved in the preservation of audiovisual heritage in their yeah. country as well. And then, evermore, we also have members of the industry. They have a special membership called supporting membership. Um, and then we have organizations like a, a, a broad plethora of, of members, such as um, um, FIFA, the International uh, Football Association. Uh, um, the New York Times for a while uh, was a member yeah. of ours and, and, and several others. So, so it, it goes into, into several directions, but the, I, would, I would say the stronghold is, is really, um, the, or the real focus is really, uh, media archives, uh, traditionally television, but ever more venturing into radio, um, video at large, uh, all, all these kind of things. Yeah. And, and when you say uh, the industry, uh, what do you mean when you refer to the industry? Yeah, good question. Uh, I'd say companies like AVP. Okay. Um, um, or, or, or all kinds of um, services so service and providers. goods providers. Okay, got it. Yeah, service provide digitization companies, but um, consultants, um, software developers, ever more also uh, companies in the field of, um, of uh, artificial intelligence. MAM and DAM, obviously, obviously. Uh, they're very closely connected to our community. So, yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean with the industry. So you've given us a picture of, you know, that it's a global organization um, can you offer some sort of breakdown of members? Give yeah, um, as I said, um, our, our stronghold and our and our historical background is mainly in, in in Europe. That's for sure. So we're talking about yeah, once again, forty fifty percent European members. Um, but I want to stress that uh, amongst our founding members were also American companies, uh, American uh, broadcasters such as uh, NBC, CNN. Um, um, Later on, we also got uh, CBC Radio Canada, for example, as a as a member. Um, in Latin America, we're um, yeah also in the in the realm of, of public broadcasting, but also commercial broadcaster. For example, uh, Globo, the Globo Group, which is the largest commercial broadcaster of Latin America, is a member of ours. Um, then, if you go to Africa, you 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 typically um, once again uh, are with. Um, Public broadcasters, the South African Public Broadcasting Organization, for example, um, and if we look at yeah the Middle East and your Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera, um, towards uh, the other parts of Asia, the Japanese Public Broadcaster was one of our early members, um, ABC in, in 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 Australia. So we really have a global outlook, but I I I do want to recognize that we that we um, that we are mainly. Uh, Europe Eurocentric. I regret to say, because the ambition is 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 to be global. Mm. Well, that still sounds like. I mean, I I have attended Fiat IFTA conferences, and I, they definitely are are attended by participants worldwide. They feel very global. So I 
I appreciate the uh, the the transparent uh, Eurocentric uh, admission there, but I, but I would say that probably if you had it, it's doing a lot better than a lot of organizations in global representation. Um, the I know that you have done surveys in the past and your time, I think even before you were president, you were involved in a working group that did some surveys to the Fiat IFTA membership. And I think since you've been president, you've done some of these. I won't ask you to go into all of them, but I wonder, are there any that were particular in, particularly interesting in their findings? And would you be willing to share maybe what the questions, you know, what was the gist of the questions and what were the findings? Yeah, I, I it's true that, that, um, we do love surveys as a, as an instrument because it's um, interesting towards our members and, and 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 also towards our broader stakeholder group. Um, and a survey that we do on an annual basis is called "Where Are You on the Timeline," and it's that 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 really says it all in the sense that we're doing it now this year probably for the fifteenth consecutive hey. time. Um, and it's a really short survey. It's a uh, it's six or seven questions. I I, I should check that. I've run it personally uh, for three or four years. Um, it really asks three, uh, sorry, five, six, seven questions in a very concise way, and it, and it asks, um, it allows the respondents to ask, uh, sorry, to to respond um, with a multiple choice. So um, they just pick the answer that fits that fits or that describes their situation best. Yeah. And the answers are formulated in a progressive way. So um, you you uh, you just indicate what stage you are in 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 what we considered when we drafted this survey a logical evolution of things, and that that survey really allows us to see and to monitor the evolution that that our members and 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 beyond because it's not responding is not restricted to to their membership. Um, what level, what stage that archives are in. And we've seen things evolving up until um, up until the point where we are even saying now like we should add extra options to our yeah. to our to our scale because because things have evolved so much and we see so many archives reaching those uh, final stages that we had um, foreseen, I would say so many years ago. That we really have to extend to that survey again. So that that timeline survey is really a, 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 a nice quote. But there there have been others. We have been doing uh, surveys about uh, media asset management systems, for example, about metadata creation and 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 the way how organizations create their metadata and how they look at at that and the evolutions they expect there. So, yeah, and and sometimes we also give it a regional focus, yeah. and that's also very enlightening because. That's when our members really say, like, okay, this allows me to to compare, but really with comparable situations. Mm. So, yeah, I want to come yeah. back to the regional focus later. That that's an interesting uh, point. Uh, I'd like to ask, I guess, you know, in the surveys you've done, maybe you know, we're about halfway in between the Fiat IFTA World Conference. It, it was in October, so we're about halfway to the next one and halfway past the last one, um, but. Between the conference, you know, what you see happening in the conference and between those surveys, could you give us some sort of summary about the what you see? And of course, it's a large body of members. So, but, but any insights from that you could share about what's the, what's the state of affairs uh, related to broadcast archives uh, across the world? Yeah, yeah. Um... It's, it's, it's hard to, to answer that question in a, in a, in a, in a, in, in a, Monodirectional way. It's a very say, unfair question. The, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 on a global scale. The situation <laughs> is very different. I've been I've been privileged enough to travel the world and to see broadcasters' archives on every on every continent, mm -hmm. um, and the situation can be very different even within one region. Uh, it, it it often depends on the on on the well, let's say it like it is the financial and uh, budgetary wealth of a certain country, um, but. Um, apart from that, the evolutions that I've seen throughout the years, and 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 people will, who are a bit longer active in this field will definitely recognize that, um, is is that that real wave of digitization that has con uh, um, conquered our mm. field, I would say, and digitization not only in terms of the digitization of working um, um, methods and and 
and and the whole environment in which media is produced, but uh, but also in terms of archival digitization. So um, already in the mid two thousands, there were some alarm bells going on everywhere in the world. Like okay, this is happening. And then uh, around 2010, 2013, if I'm not mistaken, like a few very prominent audiovisual archivists in the world, um, I I always quote um, uh, Richard Wright from the BBC and, and Mike Casey from Indiana University there. They were warning and they were saying like, um, beware, dear colleagues, because around somewhere around 2023, 2028, um, to digitize large quantities of magnetic media, either audio or video, will become um, practically unaffordable. Not impossible in the sense that technically machines will stay around, some machines will stay around. If you have a huge collection, collection uh, several hundreds of thousands of these uh, audiovisual carriers, such as um, radio and television stations typically have, then things might become unaffordable. Um, it's going to cost so much money to have those uh, carriers digitized that you're not going to be able to pay it anymore. Yeah. And and actually that wave is now, I, I would say, coming to an end in some parts of the world. There are several broadcasters uh, in the Fiat IFTA membership, for example, that have finished digitization. Hey. My own um, employer here in Switzerland at RSI, we have uh, practically finished almost everything. I think we're at 98% or so. Um, we're just thinking of, of, of re-digitizing some film material, but that's it. Um, but there are indeed many broadcasters still in the world that haven't digitized uh, everything yet. I mean, I was in Tunisia a few uh, weeks ago and I... I hesitate to, 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 to say this because I don't want to blame anybody, but we have to look reality straight in the eyes. Uh -huh. And reality is that um, we are losing that battle. Yeah. We are losing that battle and, 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 and it's important to, to, to be aware of that. In the poorer parts of the world, um, what Mike Casey, I already, already mentioned his name, what Mike Casey has called... Um, Degradations, this portmanteau concept of, of of degradation and obsolescence is striking, and it's striking first in the poorest parts of the world. Um, but it, it, I, I, I thought first it was a coincidence, but it, when I started thinking about it, it wasn't. In the last two days, I received two notifications, two emails from broadcasters, and I won't mention their name because that doesn't make any sense, but from poorer parts of the world asking whether I considered it possible in their country to have two-inch open reel video tapes digitized. And I, my clear and honest answer was no, not even in your neighboring countries. Hey. So, yeah, that, that degradescence is, is, is striking. We are coming at that point now that was predicted so many years ago um, by so many people. Um, so that's, a, that's an important e evolution that I want to point to. Another one... And, and, and it's partially overlapping now is that that AI wave. Mm. It's undeniably yeah. so. I mean, it has been for long predicted. It has been predicted for so long in the broadcast world. As I said, um, as early as the early 2000s, we were all talking about it. We were, uh, the world was buzzing. Like there is this new technology that's going to take over the documentation, the documentalist's job. And then the strange thing is that we had to wait for it so long that some in the media archiving uh, world already started to doubt. They said, "Like, isn't it all rumors? Isn't it all? Isn't it all like um, like um, fake news almost?" Mm -hmm. And and I I my answer, my personal answer was always like, "It's not a question of if; it's a question of when." Mm -hmm. um, and and when you if you're seeing now how quickly things are going um i i am still convinced that broadcast archives were amongst the first um parts of 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 um the media industry that adopted artificial intelligence first um and we are very aware of what was coming but then still we were surprised by the speed that it by the, by the speed that it actually made 
uh, throughout the last, uh, let's say, two years uh, after the launch of ChatGPT GPT and, and DALI, everything changed, of, of, of course. Yeah. So that's that other wave that I've seen coming. Yeah, I do. You're right. I remember uh, early, mid 2000s, uh, a lot of hype around AI and just major disappointment on the execution and delivery of the promise. And uh, it did take a yeah. while. Yeah, it took 10, 15 years before it came back with something that was impressive enough to grab people's attention. Um, although we did see lots of organizations doing smaller, interesting kind of proof of concepts along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to go back to, you touched on, and this, this touches on, a, you talked about the regional nature uh, of your surveys and things. You talked about uh, how countries uh, with less resources are suffering, you know, kind of the, the lack of digitization. Can you help people understand what's lost if if these materials are lost to degradation and obsolescence? What, you know, across the globe as you look, what what, what are some things that we miss out on um, both regionally but globally uh, in our understanding of, of the world uh, that goes along with the media that's lost? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question. But uh, because I I um um I every now and then I have to I have to give that answer to make people aware. But I'm gonna give you a, a very a very simple answer. Uh, let's have a look at um the um let's focus for a second on Africa. Um, the the African wave of independence, so that started off around the mid '50s uh, in Ghana. It was Kwame Nkrumah, which was a, a, a an African leader of of a uh, great charismatic leader. Um, and I'm not gonna st tell the whole story of the independence of Ghana, but my point is that's where it all started off, and it it continued up until the the '70s. That wave of independence, but that is also the era in which. Um, Broadcasting, television pr production was actually switching gradually from film recording onto video recording. So that era is the era in which, from which we have the oldest videotapes. Also in those countries, you have to be aware that the countries that the, those African com countries um, become became independent of were mainly, as we know, European, Western European countries, France, Great Britain, um, um, Belgium, my own, my own country. Um, and those television systems in those countries had been installed by those colonizers. So they were also the ones that provided technology and that decided about the technology. And that was videotape uh, evermore. And after that independence, of course, those those broadcasters or public broadcasters, they became um, independent institutions under the under the wings of their governments, of course, um, and they are still now preserving their archives. But um, once again, I'm not blaming anyone here. I'm I'm just I'm just describing a few facts. In many um, African countries that became independent in the 50s, 60s, 70s, those archives are in a dreadful state. So what these archives are losing and what their countries are losing is the audiovisual documentation of their birth. Mm, wow. So keep, right. it, it, take a second to think about that. Yeah. Take a second to think. The, the American Declaration of Independence, can you imagine that you would say, ah, sorry, we can't read it anymore? Right. That's what's happening, uh, happening now in Africa. Now, as we speak. Right. That's what's happening. Right. And 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 then then take this on a global scale, and then I would say like, okay, um, let's make a little comparison. Um, try to imagine today's world and the importance of audiovisual media, and try to be aware that um, also during throughout the course of the twentieth century, many many historical evolutions were documented on radio and television. Television and radio were amongst the most popular media and the most influential media in the 20th century. Yeah. You cannot explain the rise to power of Adolf Hitler without acknowledging the role of radio. Mm -hmm. So try to imagine that we would lose that kind of heritage. Try to imagine that, we, that we'd have to explain history without having access to, to radio and television as, as historical sources. Right. 
it would simply be impossible. And and, and then now I quit. I would say I arrest my kids. Yeah. Wow. Well, you can imagine. So, I mean, just to kind of reiterate and follow up on what you just said, the the fast forward 50, 100 years, um, I would say even with the presence of archives, uh, it, it can be difficult to represent the true narrative of, of history. Um, but the source material is there, right? Imagine what you, the picture you've just painted in many cases across the world, the source material is lost. Um, just what a major shaping uh, of, of the historical narrative takes place from that, that, that mis that, that could, uh, and I would say it's probably likely to misrepresent, you know, what's happened, uh, historically across the globe. That's, that's major. Yeah. You make a good, a very can good I, case. Can I, can I, can I point to, to one simple example as well? Just a, a sm- very small state on the globe. It's called, uh, Timor Leste, uh, Portuguese for Eastern Timor. It's a, it's a small island close to, close to Indonesia. And, um, that country became independent in the, in the nineties. And there was a, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's a French German cameraman called Max Stahl. And he um, documented all that was going on in the independence war because that country has become independent from Indonesia. Now, filming there, that cameraman um, has filmed a lot of the, the violence of the Indonesian army throughout uh, that, that war of independence. That archive in itself is documenting the birth of Timor Leste in the nineties. Mm. Um, luckily, that archive was saved at some point, also thanks to the intervention of INA, the the French National Audiovisual uh, Institute. Um, but that is another example of a country that could could have lost the documentation of its birth, um, paired with with let's say it like it is, um, crimes against humanity. Um, yeah. By the the during dur- during that that in war of independence, so it it demonstrates once again that unique documentational role of 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 not only of media corporations of course, but also of uh, of audiovisual heritage in general. Do you have feedback or requests for the Damn Right podcast? Hit me up and let me know at damnright at weareavp dot com. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right Podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash in slash C Lysenic. I, I want to shift away from this specific topic, but stay in the general theme of kind of differences uh, and discrepancies across the globe. And I'm going to maybe just focus in a bit on um, well, I'll ask you to paint a picture for us, but maybe we can use kind of Europe versus the United States as an, as a place to focus in on in particular, which is, I think a lot of people, you know, if you haven't been in the field, you may not recognize just how different broadcast operations look, uh, in various countries. Uh, and, and here I think of both the commercial versus the non-commercial nature, the public, um, kind of, you know, government, uh, backed, uh, uh, broadcasters versus commercial broadcasters. Uh, can you, can you paint a picture for people what some of those differences look like and how they operate, how they're funded, uh, and, and what that, what the meaning there is? Yeah, it's, 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 it's true what you say, uh, that there is often a, a very big difference between, um, I would say profit driven and non-profit organization in that, that respect. Um, for what I see or what I know from my, from my, from my daily experience, I haven't worked for a, for a commercial broadcaster yet, but what I, what I, um, what I know is, is, is firsthand, um, testimonial by people who work there is that typically a, a commercial broadcaster has less of that heritage perspective. Um, and that's okay. And it's perfectly legitimate. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that they should, um, but um, when you are in a public broadcaster, there is also, there is this double perspective always. There is always this double perspective between, uh, on the one hand, and this is something they, um, they have in common with commercial broadcasters, 
broadcasters archives are always there to, in the first place, to support their own production, their own production departments. And that's, that's what they typically cater for, I would say. Um, but at the same time, um, there is always this perspective of um, a contribution to society. A public broadcaster's archive is always supposed to, um, to help external customers as well. And external customers that often don't have a, a commercial perspective at all, uh, libraries, museums, um, whether they want to access that, that, those archives in a, in a, um, I would say in a, in a, in a small kind of way, just asking for one or two tapes or one or two or two clips or so, or whether they want to use it really on a structural scale to open it up towards the, ed the whole educational world and the whole school system, et cetera, et cetera. And as a public broadcast archivist, you can barely, you can't barely say no to that kind yeah. of requests. And it's, it's, it's not an intention either. I mean, I, I always say like without use, a broadcaster's archive, a broadcaster's, uh, a public broadcaster's archive, uh, their shelves are empty. If you understand what I mean, mm -hmm. they, they, um, um, this, this, this kind of, um, the, what I call the heritage perspective, contributing with the archives to the society's needs without the requirement of, um, of earning money with that. That is a, an, a perspective that is always present in a public broadcaster's archive. In a commercial broadcaster's archive, and I've, 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 I've seen that several times, that, that kind of perspective is absent or close to absent. Um, and that gives them the liberty to take decisions with their archive that I, as an, as an, as an historian, sometimes regret. You can barely you can barely blame them for that because in many countries there is no such thing as um, as what what is called a legal deposit, the legal obligation to deposit yeah. um, a copy of what you have broadcasted broadcasted to some kind of institution that then um, preserves it and and in the longer run respecting copyright etc cetera, etc cetera, in the longer run gives access to it such as it happens with with books. So, so many countries in the world have a legal deposit for books or any kind of written publication. Yeah. So little countries in the world have a legal deposit when it comes to audiovisual publications and especially, um, especially uh, uh, radio and television broadcasts. And, and, and that's the, the, the difference in the perspective that I, that I see so, so often. It doesn't exclude that some, some commercial broadcasters do have that heritage perspective as well um, in certain part of the world, and I and I really respect them deeply for that, because they are often not obliged to do so. On the contrary, the 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 driver that they often have much more is a is a profit driven driver. So they they often really consider their archives as a a source of income, mm -hmm. and and once again that's perfectly legitimate. But it's a whole completely different perspective. For them, it's a way to valorize in a financial way what they have. It's really assets in the true sense of the word, uh, on condition, of course, that they're findable and that they have the right to exploit them in a financial right. way, of course. Um, but it's a completely different perspective. And 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 just a, as a side note, in Fiat Ifta, we bring those two together. So you can Im imagine how difficult it can be to, 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 to unite those two perspectives sometimes. I feel like I have seen instances um, of... Uh, broadcast archives that are not commercial, uh, also trying to uh, valorize their archives uh, to, in order to create, I think, a more sustainable kind of business model, even when it is um, a government-based institution. Is is that right? Have you seen that as well? Yeah, that's correct. That's uh, that's absolutely correct. I, I, I let's not deny that uh, um, um, many public broadcasters financing is public financing is under heavy pressure in many countries what you see what you see is um, currently for example in Slovakia um, the government is, is threatening heavily the financing the funding of, of public broadcasting and um, so public broadcasters do all they can to mitigate that kind of effects to by searching for other sources of revenue and Selling or licensing archival materials are, 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 are for many broadcasters 
one of their many ways to counter those effects. And um, um, that for me doesn't necessarily mean that it is a big source of revenue. Yeah. We, we have to be honest about that. There are not many public broadcasters archives that can fund, I would say not even two or three uh, full-time equivalents on an annual basis with what they sell in terms of footage. Yeah. That, that's something to keep in mind. There is no, in my opinion, there is no sustainable financing model for public broadcasting based on the licensing of footage or archival material. I'm, I'm very sorry for those who, who believe in that, but I don't, I don't. Yeah, that was, years ago, there was a, a, a concept I was running with around cost of inaction uh, which was talk, which was kind of you know, looking at the traditional return on investment, and because I, I had within organizations of all types, uh, broadcasters, non-broadcasters, universities, you know, all sorts, uh, this concept that usually executives in the organization would hold around: how can we see a return on investment on our archives? And it's, it just it never calculated out to be advantageous. And it seemed to always lack a holistic perspective on what the true value was. If you you know it wasn't, it didn't just come down to dollars. And while that's obviously important, funding is a critical uh, issue. That yeah. when you look at it alone, it never seemed to do the the issue real justice. Um, and and some of the things you talked about earlier really paint a picture about the value um, of, of these archives. Yeah, if I if I can, can, can just intervene because I want to add a, a perspective. Um, um, in 2013, there was a research by the Danish Public Broadcasters Archive. And what they did was for one week, seven consecutive days, 24-7, they, um, they um, recorded the full broadcasting, the full broadcasting schedule on, on, on their two main channels. And they measured the duration of all the content that was being broadcasted. And they make the distinction between broadcasted for the first time or not broadcasted for the first time. And they came to the conclusion that 75% of the broadcasting schedule, the duration of the broadcasting time, was not filled with content that was broadcasted for the first time. And they said, this means that this content has passed through the archive. Mm. 75% so, of that broadcasting time. And if you take a look from that perspective, you could say it, it's 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 probably not an exact calculation, but you could think like if we'd have to fill all that time with um, new productions or with 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 um, acquired stuff, broadcasting would probably cost us three to four times as oh, much. Oh, that's interesting, right? Right. I found that an interesting that's perspective like that because you never get to think it. Th yeah, you, you 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 never get to think about things that way. Right. But yeah, and it's it's not exact, of course, that measurement. But it, but it switches your mind in mindset. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good framing. Well, let's jump. I want to jump into. You know, we haven't. We've talked kind of up high. I'd like to jump into what does a broadcast television archive look like? And we've just talked about all the disparities and differences. So obviously, I want to lean on your personal experience here. Um, can you offer some insights into, uh, you know, for someone who maybe has worked in digital asset management, has worked in archives, uh, but has never worked in a radio and television archive? Uh, and here you've had the experience, you know, at MAMO, you saw all sorts of organizations. So you, broadcast was just one, one source. There was lots of others. So you do have some unique perspective here. Um, can you give us some insights into like, what is a radio and television broadcast archive look like? How's it staffed, organized, those sorts of, those sorts of things? Yeah, let's, let's first uh, start off by saying that the size of the country usually does not necessarily coincide with the size of the broadcasters of the, or the size of the broadcasters archive. The determining factor is how many channels they have had throughout their history. Mm. That is the that typically describes the size of the collection. If we mm. if we if we uh, talk about that, so typically in a, any kind of country for a long while, you've had like 
for a while one channel, then a second one, then a third one, and four to five, and then some regional channels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then television came in the 50s, and they started with one channel. They added a second, sometimes a third or a fourth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you're venturing into the into the 21st century. So that's that's um, and, and typically that created um, up until let's say the the end of the 90s, the start of the 21st century, that created collections about say 400 to 500,000 hours of, um, of film and videotape and often taking into account that a lot has been lost, um, 200 to 300,000 of hours of, of, of radio or broadcasted radio content, taking into account as well that, uh, that um, typically the music programs are not being preserved because their content is not considered unique. So that there, there you have an idea about the size of those collections and then take into account that in the 21st century, uh, 21st century when, when the MAM system, systems came up, television and radio archives were um, much better prepared and much better able to, um, to preserve everything that they were broadcasting. Yeah. So then you're really talking about an explosion of, of content. And these days, it's absolutely no exception that you come into a broadcaster's archive and you meet, um, say, collections of more than a million hours of uh, of, uh, of television content, um, six, seven, eight hundred thousands of hours of, of, of radio uh, broadcast content. Um, and then when it comes to the structure of these archives, um, once again, up until I would say the 90s, the, 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 the early 2000s, many, many broadcasters, public broadcasters and also commercial ones had a distinction between their, if they were making radio as well, there was a distinction between television and radio, yeah. and they had separate archives. That also had historical backgrounds, and I, I, I could, I could talk about that for ages, but, but, but I'm, I'm not gonna, gonna do that. But um, in the 2000s, many of those um, radio and television archives they merged within one organization. They became one up until a certain extent, of course, because there were some differences in the processes and. Well, what they do is, is, is I, I tend to keep things clear and to, to say like their typical activities are situated in, in acquisition and preservation. Mm -hmm. um, as, and yeah, well, the broad domain of acquisition and preservation. And then they intend to invest a lot of their resources also in documentation and cataloging. A lot of their re resources because those processes were the most labor intensive typically and, and, and also um, therefore the the most expensive. And then a part, a third um, domain of activities is, 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 is in access and valorization, either internally by delivering their content to um, their own production environments or um, by um, selling uh, footage sales or, uh, and or by devel developing all kinds of platforms or websites to which the larger audience or specific target groups within society can access those archives, and there there is a difference, as I said earlier on, between the public and the commercial, uh, the commercial broadcasters. Yeah. So that gives you an idea, and then, and then maybe what, what you what you said about the number of staff. Well, it it's it strongly depends. It strongly depends. Here at um, here at RSI, I have a team of about forty. Okay. Um, but I, I, huh, I my, my, um, the general secretary of Fiat IFTA, uh, Virginia Bassan, she is now head of archives at the Spanish public broadcaster RTVE. And if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, her staff is between 350 and 400 wow. people. So, yeah. Um, I want to come back to staff and kind of what your staff does, but I want to touch on something as you were talking, I just had the, you know, the thought we were talking about differences and types of archives. I just want to say in my experience, I mean, you're talking about preservation and archiving as a role uh, within the organizations you've been in, and those have been uh, public broadcasters. Uh, I would say that there is a big difference I've seen between broadcasters in that uh, it sounds like I'm gonna guess that the organizations you have worked for have had a mandate or a mission of some sort to preserve and archive. You know, in other yes. broadcasters we've worked with, uh, they may or may not have a mandate, but they might have a very strong business case. You know, they, they have content that they can monetize and it's very popular content. Um, and so they have a business case to preserve an archive, even if they don't have a mandate. Um, 
which which has implications because for the stuff that is less popular uh, or less monetizable, right? Then there then that tends to get l- lesser treatment. So a mandate doesn't cover uh, a mandate would typically cover things that are both popular and non popular. So there are implications to having a business case without a mandate. And then there are organizations that we have run across many of um, who don't have a mandate and don't have a really strong business case whose collections have either been thrown in dumpsters or saved from dumpsters by uh, a university or some other entity that sees the cultural value uh, and and, uh, and and grabs it because they see it, even if the organization that created it doesn't. So I just want to point out that difference uh, across different organizations. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right in that. Yeah, definitely. It's a it's a it's an observation that I've made as well, and there are some some regional difference differences in the world as well. There, I think. Let's come back to the staffing uh, for your organization that has forty. I think you said forty four zero, right? Yes. Okay. Um, can you just describe some of the like what are some of the roles and responsibilities tasks? I guess I wonder how does it bump up against how does your operation bump up against kind of the production side of the operation, and then on the other side, like on the on the um, distribution, publishing, access side. Um, what's the division of and roles and responsibilities on what you all do? And I guess you know, maybe one thing to focus on in particular would be like description. Like how much how much metadata and description is there on the way in? How much do you guys do? And then how much you know is there done post? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question because that exactly that point that you're talking to is in in it's is currently um, that's my feeling is being revolutionized mm. by AI yeah. uh, um, amongst others. And um, a typical situation, I would say, in a, in a, in a broadcaster's archive uh, currently um, is that there is a production. Let's, let's limit ourselves to television only for now uh, because radio is somewhat parallel there. But um, you have a production platform and several production systems and post-production systems circulating around a what you would call um, a PAM system, a, a, a production asset management system. And then from the archives uh, part, uh, connected, often connected to that PAM, you have a MAM, a media asset management uh, system. And, and, and those two are, are, are often connected to each other. And that situation might differ from organization to organization depending on how they look at things and, and, and where they situate their, their archive exactly at the right in the middle of the production process or at the end of the chain of production. Um, that is still a point of, of, of debate with, manage, with, with, many, with many broadcasters' archives. Mm-hmm. But typically what you see is that um, broadcasters' archives try to connect their systems in such a way that as many descriptive, administrative, and technical metadata are um, inherited by the archival databases coming from all kinds of production systems. And so they connect these systems to each other through APIs and other kinds of um, uh, protocols, I would say. And then they try that way to limit the manual work that still has to be done by the documentalists. Um, that is a typical situation. Uh, but as I said, it's in full it's in full evolution there because yeah. um, what is jumping in is AI. Right. And um, so what we have seen throughout the history is that um, four big, Groups of metadata creation have 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 grown, I would say, and those are like the old school manual work from the, by documentalists that has been around for eighty years, say. Um, then um, inheritance by true production systems, inheritance, um, connect, what I just described, mm-hmm. like connecting PAM and MEM systems and inheriting as much metadata as possible. And then a third group, which is kind of a bit off the radar these days, but nevertheless interesting, is what 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 we used to call user-generated metadata. The the metadata that that users that are involved in documentation processes via any kind of project, for example, could create and then deliver to the archive. 
um, but also in conscious ways of doing that. And I, I tend to call that production, uh, sorry, uh, consumer generated metadata. The fact that you that you watch a clip for only five seconds and not for 10 seconds is what I would call an interesting consumer generated metadata for the archive. It's, 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 it all has to do with met, uh, media companies being data driven these days. And the fourth way of, of, um, of generating metadata is the broad world of AI, uh, what I would call automatically generated metadata in some way. Now, what I had been thinking 10 years ago is that um, those four would, those four groups would always be combined and, and um, they're covering up for their weaknesses and, 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 and strengths and, and finally result in a fully in, in a fully filled up archival database. What I'm seeing now is that the quality of um, the results of artificial intelligence algorithms is increasing so quickly. And um, the cost of, for example, connecting MAM systems and PAM systems and, and all kinds of systems that could provide metadata that cost is so high that it's quickly being overhauled by the evolution of AI algorithms. Also because all those several systems within a broadcast and within the media production, they all have what I call asynchronous life cycles. Mm -hmm. um, the te their technologies evolve in their own way. And many, many broadcasters, they call upon the service of, of, of external providers or they tend to use a plethora of systems and to make them communicate to each other is has become impossible and then all of a sudden ai is there as well and obtains results that are nearly as good and often cheaper could you put some more clarity i just want to talk a bit more on the like you talked about pam uh, and for listeners there is a i've heard pam recently but on the cpg consumer product side uh, for product asset management. So this is not that, this is production okay. asset okay. management, which is Some management. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. In, the, in the kind of production and post part of the organization. And you mentioned MAM. I wonder, in your experience, where have <clears throat> MAM and DAM lived in an organization uh, and how does that interact? How does the archive interact with that? That's a, that's a good question as well, because um, when I first contributed to the development of a MAM system that was in 2006-2007 when I was working for the Flemish Public Broadcaster VRT. The reasoning was that a MAM system would be the, I would say, the spinal cord uh, of, of, of media production and the, ar the archive's main database at the same time. So the 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 theoretical um, background to that, and I I, I I wish to refer to one author in particular, that's Annemieke de Jong from the Netherlands Sound and Vision, yeah. Netherlands Institute for Sound. She did a lot of work around this, and she said like what we see is that the the archive evolves from being at the end of the production chain into the center of the production chain, and she was right that her her her, her theoretical thesis was was absolutely correct, um, but still that didn't really happen. Um, I don't know why. It's, it's, it's hard to say why it, it, it didn't, didn't happen completely, completely as, it, as, it, as she predicted. But I do think that many broadcasters have been bringing in the expertise of our, our audiovisual archivists into the center of their production environment because they acutely became aware of the importance of... Um, yeah, I, I can't describe it with other words than managing their assets. Yeah. And whether you do it with uh, with the aim to, I would say, them store them for the long term or store them to be reused the day after, I would almost say, what's the difference? The, pra the practices are the same. Yeah, yeah. You could add, you, for the archivist, you could, you could then come up with the whole story of digital preservation and long-term preservation, tens of, 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 of years, et cetera, et cetera. That's a world in itself, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but often, and, and, and this is also what makes broadcasters archives a bit um, 
particular, often that kind of of um, of, of subjects, that kind of um, challenges, are tackled by the IT departments. Mm -hmm. Strangely enough, because radio and television archives, they have been also logistics guys and gals, you yeah. know. Um, but 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 the whole digital logistics part is now covered by IT engineers that are not working anymore for the archives department. Yeah. And what I've seen in broadcast operations too, I mean, you have, of course, scheduling systems, which are their own kind of asset management components. So I, my my yep. view in is that the landscapes within broadcast operations with regard to digital asset management are typically more complex than, you know, in say a corporate archive uh, or a corporate entity uh, where you kind of, you have some very specific spots. You tend to see DAM, MAM, PAM, you know, those sorts of things. Um, I want to shift a bit towards talking about as broadcast operations or broadcasters move more towards on demand and streaming as being the primary driver, I'll say, um, what is that, what are the implications of that to the archives within these organizations? Are there implications there? Yeah, definitely. I think I, I, this is also an evolution to which I think many archivists have been looking forward um, because it stresses the importance of the archive. And and I've um, I on an annual basis I I I, um, I contribute to the call for papers of of um, of the Fiat IFTA World Conference. And and this year, and it's not the first time, I I I really push to. <laughs> to have one theme in this call for papers that is like OTT platforms over the top platforms or streaming platforms or archival catalogs. What's the difference? Okay. That to me is an intriguing question. We are evolving ever more with, with, with broadcasting, with television towards a world. And it might even be more the case in, in the US than it is already here over here in Europe. We are evolving ever more into a situation where, um, Linear broadcasting is becoming, yeah, a marginal thing, and 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 I even foresee within a few years um, the closing down of television st uh, stations. Um, um, the 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 general director of the BBC has announced that there won't be a, a linear broadcasting by the BBC anymore by twenty thirty. I think that's realistic. Yeah. And and then the question becomes what what those broadcasters, if you can still call them that, those media companies are offering is content. Mm -hmm. Right? It's content on their on any kind of platform. And what what the um what the archive has been offering is content as well. It might have not be content that is recently produced, it might be content that has been produced a bit earlier. But the border between the two is ever more getting irrelevant. And I, I remember illustrating that evolution towards people who inquired with me about it by, by, by saying like, um, for you, when does the archive begin? If you have to count back from now, from one second ago, you're listening to the radio, watching television, when does the archive begin? And most people then say like, hmm, maybe one year ago, Ten years ago, <laughs> then my my answer is: How can you reasonably sustain such an answer? <laughs> it's it it doesn't it doesn't make sense. Uh -huh. It it for me the archives begin begins tomorrow because in our archive as we speak the the interview with the Pope that I recent that, that I just referred to was already in our archive a month before it was spread worldwide. Yeah. So we already have stuff in our archive that is that is like not not even yet broadcasted. Right. So, right, it's coming ever more together. It's it's uh, the the it's the lines are really are, are really blurring there. So does the linear broadcasting then gets replaced by um, platforms for uh, watching and listening to content and 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 the linear component, I guess, the kind of curation gets replaced, I guess, by recommendation engines and things like that, that seem to look at what the, the behavior of the consumer and tries to feed them content they think they'll be interested in. Is that what the future looks like, you think, for broadcasts? 
Yeah, I, 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 I don't think I'm saying revolutionary things. If I, if I, if I agree with you, yeah, def, uh, that, that's that's how I, how I look at things. And then, then the question for the archivist, but also for the person responsible for filling those those um, those platforms, could be like, what kind of things from our huge catalog of recently produced or long time ago produced stuff are we going to publish today mm -hmm. i mean i i i, I want to illustrate this with with a with a, a a very in my opinion a very interesting evolution the so in france the um the archive of the public broadcaster and and of so many other broadcasters is managed by the Institut National de l'Audiovisuel, the French National Audiovisual Institute, which is one of the biggest audiovisual archives in the world. And they have decided to call themselves, themselves since last year, a media heritage company. Yeah. They have their own uh, streaming platform. They, have, they, they are, um, I would say, as much a streaming platform as Netflix is. Mm, right. That says it right. all to me. It says it all. If just evolved into something Netflix like right or something Disney like right right what what are the ethical considerations here I mean that do you I, I guess you know do you just open up the archive entirely how does rights play into that how does content that this station you know may want to put some sort of you know moderation or context around that's historic and maybe problematic in some ways like what what is it what do you think that looks like that's also a very intriguing and very interesting question and i'm 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 really aware of the sensitivity of this of of this subject just because um our our broadcasting history our media history is almost um it's touching for many people is touching upon almost what I would call their identity. Mm -hmm. And that once again proves between brackets how how influential television has been throughout its its, its history. Yeah, if people find their their favorite programs from their favorite channels that 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 have been broadcasted so many years ago and, and, and that colored their youth, if they find that so important well, that 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 shows how how impactful uh, television, in particular, but radio also have have been. But I, I I this might be also a bit of a of a European standpoint. Um, but um, I think in Europe, our answer, although we had it took us some time to learn to deal with this, eh? but um, we I think we recognize. I'm really careful choosing my words here. I think we recognize that broadcasters' archives are undeniably reflecting their own history and the history of uh, human conceptions and human ideas throughout history. And if we want to look history in the eyes, <laughs> we also have to look into the eyes of the more painful parts of our history. And Let's make no mistake, for example, the use of language evolves with humanity. And I always say, who knows which kinds of words that we pronounce now without asking ourselves any question, which, which words will be considered in 50 years from now very problematic. Uh -huh. We don't know that yet. And the people who pronounced those words 50 years ago they, in some cases, have been unrespectful also. Eh? There are some words that were 100 years ago already insulting and still they were used 50 years ago. Um, mm. But they have been used. And as an historian, it's my opinion that you cannot falsify history. What you can do as, a, as an archivist is point to those problematic episodes of your own history and say, look... What we are showing you here is um, n not intended as a source of um, as a source of entertainment, not necessarily. Please consider it as an historical document as yeah. well that was made in an era with certain values, applicable editorial values, editorial guidelines applied in the era of production. And today, 
we adhere different norms. Yeah. And if 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 you think that this would be insulting to you, we're warning you already that this might occur, right. but we're we're not going to hide it because it is our own history and it's a difficult part of our history now, today, but it's there. And 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 and, and you could then argue like do you have to publish it in such a public way? Shouldn't you just keep it on a sidetrack that is only accessible for historians or so? That's a different discourse as well. When you say, I just want to clarify, when you say you can't falsify history, I, I take that to mean that you, what you're saying is um, you can't hide the ugly parts away and just show one part. That would be a falsifying of history. Is that the right interpretation of what you just said? Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. Correct. And I, I realize how problematic this 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 might be. But it's the historian yeah. speaking here. Uh um and yeah, it's it's a debate that is not yet finished. And I I, I, I see it also on, on, on OTT and streaming platforms all over the globe. Um that that broadcasters and, and media companies tend to tend to to con consider this question in a different way. And it also has to do with how they interpret their own role. I, I, I find it perfectly legitimate that a company like Disney says, look, um, our, our streaming platform is not intended as an historical source. Uh -huh. it's, and it's intended as a form of entertainment. Those historians who would want to watch the original things, because for them, for their historical profession, it's important that they ac can access authentic sources. Right. For them, we have other ways to show them. Right. It uh, what, what I mean is it depends on your mission. Yeah, yeah no, course. that's a very interesting uh, kind of dissection of, of you've got, because under, it, it would be easy to look at broadcast all as under the entertainment umbrella. I think that's probably how most people would think of it. And so it's interesting to just kind of put that point on there to say that in some cases it's in the mission of the organization, you know, that there's a documentation, historical documentation component, um, perspective lens, uh, and then there's an entertainment perspective or lens. And those are two different animals that, that may get treated in two different ways. Yeah. Then, um, well, let's, let's wrap up here. You've been very generous with your time. And before we start, you said you've got more work to do today. It's already late where you are. Uh, so I don't want to keep it too much longer. But uh, maybe could you tell the listeners uh, when the next uh, Fiat IFTA conference is and where it is? The next Fiat IFTA World Conference takes place from the 15th to the 18th of October in uh, Bucharest, Romania hosted by the public broadcaster of Romania, TVR. So that sounds like a, a, an interesting and fun destination to go to as well as a great conference. Um, yeah, definitely. And uh, I'll share uh, I'll share a link to in the show notes with to the conference or into the Fiat IFTA uh, site so folks can find that if they're interested in finding out more. Um, I wanna, I'm going to wrap the this with a uh, question that I ask all of our damn right guests, uh, which is, what is the last song that you added to your favorites playlist? Feel free to look at your phone. Yeah, now, now this can be a very shameful moment, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it lets us okay no it's it's not so shameful it's not so shameful it's The Way It Is by Bruce Horns being the range alright a classic classic song and also a, a, you could you could say it's an archival re, it, it has been uh, archivally reused uh -huh. um, um, so what, what was the so several what was times. the circumstance was it, did it come up on shuffle or something you're like oh I have to add this to my liked list or, or uh, did you I seek it out because you remembered it and and how did it come to end up on your favorites playlist? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a it's got a great melody in in, in my opinion. But it um, it um, you know that that piano. Mm -hmm. it, I I'm always intrigued by how musicians come to that that kind of genius melodies, mm -hmm. you know. And um, but but um, no, it was just pure coincidence. I was driving in the car and I said like, oh, I want to hear that song. And then I said like, oh, let's add it to my favorites list. Yeah, that is a great song. Great. Well, Brecht, I really appreciate your time and all the. Super interesting and valuable insights you've shared today. Uh, I, I thank you uh, very much. Uh, thanks for your service to Fiat Ifta too, uh, as the president. And um, and uh, yeah, I just 
I, I think the listeners are going to really love this episode and, and, and we'll get a lot out of it. So thank you. It's been really a pleasure to talk with you, Chris. Do you have feedback or requests for the Damn Right podcast? Hit me up and let me know at damnright at weareavp.com. Looking for amazing and free resources to help you on your damn journey? Let the best damn consultants in the business help you out. Visit weareavp.com slash free hyphen resources. And stay up to date with the latest and greatest from me and the Damn Right podcast by following me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash n slash C. Lysenek.